Hi you guys and welcome back to another true crime in makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you guys love makeup and you love true crime, definitely think about subscribing. It would mean so much to me and I hope you guys enjoy today's video. So today's case was requested by your neighborhood Bruja. So thank you so much for requesting this case. Okay, so I went into this case knowing zero, nothing about this case. But one of the first photos that popped up was a picture of this couple. And I remember seeing this picture around, but I never knew anything about this case. And it didn't ring any bells. But when I went and started to do my research, everywhere I read was just saying, like, it's the most brutal case and it's the most disturbing case. And I was like, I've literally done cases on um, Junko Furuta and then Sylvia Likens. So I'm like, come on, how brutal can a case be? But it is. It's a brutal case. And I started to like low key panic because I'm like, can I even talk about this case? Like, it's really rough, you know, some of these really intense ones. But you guys, yeah, it's a really horrific case. So I want to place this warning right here, right now. It's about Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom, who were a young couple from Knoxville, Tennessee. And the two of them were kidnapped and viciously raped and tortured and murdered in January 2007. On top of what already was a tragic event the judge in this case was also popping you know prescription drugs like candy so you can imagine the mess we're about to delve into right now and despite how horrific and brutal and tragic this case was it actually did not receive much media attention from the very beginning so let's get into today's case shannon gail christian was born on april 29th 1985 in texas and after living in louisiana for a while her family moved to Tennessee in 1997. She went on to graduate from Farragut High School in 2003 and began majoring in sociology at the University of Knoxville. And she planned to graduate in December of 2007. Shannon always did really well in school and she was known to be very beautiful and super humble. Hugh Christopher Newsom, who went by Christopher or Chris, was born on September 21st, 1983 in Knoxville. He played basketball at his high school, Halls High, and then he attended Pellissippi State Technical College where he studied carpenting. Chris was super friendly, a hard worker, a great baseball player, and he was just, just a really good guy. Now in 2007 or thereabout, Shannon was actually gifted this new car, it was a shiny new Toyota 4Runner and everyone that saw this car agreed that, you know, it was like a head turner. Shannon decorated it with her own style, you know, placing photos and accessories in the car. And she would normally drive this car from her university back and forth to her parents' house where she lived at the time. And Shannon and Chris had just begun dating at this time. They were, they were a new couple. And on January 6th, 2007, the two of them, they planned to go to dinner together and then attend a friend's party together. That afternoon, Shannon, she went to her best friend, Kara Soward's house, and she went there, you know, to get ready for the party, and Chris was supposed to meet her there later. So Chris was running late, so Shannon tells her friend Kara, like, you go ahead, go to the party, and I'll just wait here at your place for Chris. So in the meanwhile, while she's waiting for Chris, Shannon calls her mother and she says, Hey mom, um, I'm going to be coming home tonight. I won't be staying at Kara's house like I originally planned. Like I'll be coming home. So her mom was like, okay, cool. And then Shannon just went ahead and waited for Chris. And Chris arrived at Kara's place at around 8 p.m. And when he arrived, they just went straight to Kara's parking lot where their cars were parked to, you know, go to this party. And when they got to the parking lot, they were like, okay, we'll take Shannon's car because that's the car we're going to take to this party. I mean, it was a brand new car. Why not? So as they're getting ready to leave, they're both standing at the driver's side door of Shannon's car and they're talking and they're kissing. I'm guessing that's the first time they saw each other that day. So obviously they're doing what couples do. But while they were doing this, they were oblivious to the gang of carjackers that were approaching them. A group of five people, Latalvis Cobbins, Lamarcus Davidson, these two guys were half brothers. George Thomas, Eric Boyd, and Vanessa Coleman were all approaching them, and they ambushed Chris and Shannon. Suddenly, there's a gun in their faces and a lot of commotion. They want the car. 
they were both forced into the back of Shannon's car and then tied up by this group. And they were then taken to the home of LaMarcus Davidson. LaMarcus drove Shannon's car to his house while Latalvis and Eric followed them in their own separate cars. So there was three cars like going to LaMarcus's house. LaMarcus surprisingly had just been let out of prison. Okay. And was out on parole for a carjacking incident. At the time living with him was his half brother Latalvis and two friends visiting from Kentucky. And these two friends were Vanessa Coleman and her boyfriend, George Thomas. I believe also at the time was LaMarcus's girlfriend living with them, but they don't really mention that, but I think she was living with them. And then who else joined them on the night was this friend, Eric Boyd. The crew who largely came from allegedly rough upbringings, they were described as unstable and always into something. So now LaMarcus is broke and angry and he decides that he's going to carjack someone. And they actually had this plan when they stumbled across Shannon and Chris and obviously her brand new car. So I know I mentioned this before, but I also just want to say it here again. Now the details are pretty rough in this. So um, if you're uncomfortable, just please skip ahead. So the couple now who are held at gunpoint, they're taken to LaMarcus's house and it's on Chipman Street adjacent to Knoxville's Waste Center, which was like a waste and recycling plant. And when they get to LaMarcus's house, I mean, the thing that just doesn't make sense to me, it's supposed to be a carjacking, but when they get to LaMarcus's house, Chris and Shannon are raped and tortured in the most horrific ways. It was later determined that Chris had been sodomized with an object and by at least one of the men. After this, Chris is barefoot and he's bound and he has this sweatshirt like wrapped over his head and this sweatshirt was secured with shoestrings and after this Chris is forced by the male assailants to walk on a set of train tracks that is near the house. His hands and feet were then tied together and he was gagged with a sock. At the railroad tracks they still show him no mercy. LaMarcus was egging George on and George then shoots Chris in the neck and then shoots him in the back. Still alive, 23-year-old Chris starts bleeding out and he's now paralyzed on these train tracks. After this, Chris was then fatally shot by LaMarcus in the side of the head, which severed his brainstem. Now this cold-blooded and drawn-out savagery, <laughs> some other words to describe it, only escalates from here. That's not even the end of it. So now possibly in an attempt to conceal what they had done they then wrap chris's body in a like comforter they douse it in gasoline and then they set it on fire and leave it on the tracks now the lease for the chipman street residence did belong to lamarcus and his girlfriend daphne had recently moved in after he had like threatened her and like roughed her up their house was a mess with the, you know, guests from Kentucky, Vanessa and George, overstaying their welcome. There were porn DVDs, like, surrounded by the TV. Fast food wrappers spent shell casings, like, and there was also empty liquor bottles, like, all around the home. At the time, the men were out doing this to Chris. Shannon was left alone in that home with Vanessa Coleman. When LaMarcus and George, they return back to LaMarcus's home after killing Chris they then make their move on Shannon she was tied up brutally everywhere and her injuries were also consistent with being oh, with being with an object and it's believed that Shannon was actually tied to a chair as she was being like I don't I don't understand why men do this you know or like I just don't know why they do this. I just don't know why they do this. So she was also repeatedly kicked in the head and in the genitals for some reason, because, you know, it's fun to do that to someone. And, you know, doing this to her, it actually caused her to suffer major hemorrhaging in those areas. She also had many bruises and carpet burns all over her body. Evidence shows that her genitals had been mutilated 
with an object possibly being oh, like a table leg, like a broken table leg. And she was so savagely beaten and brutalized that the membranes in her mouth were so damaged. Shannon pleaded with these men, you know, begging them that she didn't want to die. And she was told that if she complied, they were actually going to let her go. She also had, at this point, significant pooling of blood in her genital area. By the way, Vanessa is fully aware of what's happening to another woman in this house and what's happening at the hands of her own boyfriend. Just, just to put that into context, it's happening right there. And even though she knows exactly what's happening, she makes zero attempt to actually help her other than bringing her like a glass of water a couple times. At more than one point, these two women are left alone together in the house. Finally, Shannon is strangled and beaten unconscious in the kitchen of the home. And then they dragged her into the living room where they then tied her up in a fetal position. And in a very feeble attempt to get rid of evidence, they douse her body in bleach. They scrub her entire body with it, including her severely damaged, oh my God, genital area. And then they even pour bleach down her throat. Shannon was then hogtied with curtains and bed sheets and then wrapped in five trash bags, basically encasing her in plastic while she's alive. But in a way, those plastic bags actually held onto a lot of fingerprints. So that's something to remember for later. Then there was a white shopping bag placed over her head. And then she was stuffed into this large Rubbermaid black trash can. Shannon slowly suffocated to death sometime between January 7th and January 8th. When her body was found, her eyes were actually open when she died. Like, I can't imagine that torture. During this time, Lamarcus then goes and hangs with his girlfriend and then he gives her some of Shannon's belongings. And then prior to this, he also took off Chris's shoes and he was seen wearing Chris's shoes. So that was that. Two human beings killed in the most brutal way for a car. I mean, they could have just taken them, taken the car and not held them hostage, you know? I don't even understand how people are willing to do this to another human being. Like I've said many times before, again, this poor woman's genitals were mutilated. And also Chris, like, you often don't hear about men being and he was raped with things and a human. Is this some form of power, pleasure for these men? I will never understand it, ever. Now, when Shannon and Chris never showed up to their friend's party that night, their friends attempted to contact them and they obviously received no response from either of them. So they then went to Kara's apartment complex where they still see Chris's car parked, but they see Shannon's car is missing. Now, the next day, Shannon's mom was also growing concerned because she was like, well, my daughter told me she's coming home for the night. She's not going to be spending the night away. So the fact that she didn't come home was concerning to her. And at this point, she was also unable to reach Shannon. Chris's parents last saw him on Saturday night, but they didn't think anything of it when he didn't come home because his dad was like, he's 23 years old. He does his own thing. Like, this isn't uncommon for him. Like, I'm not going to be chasing around a 23 year old being like, where are you at? You know? It was actually Shannon's mother, Dina, who contacted Chris's parents and said, you know what, Shannon hasn't come home. And it was Shannon's manager at work who actually contacted Dina saying, where's Shannon? She didn't come into work this day. And that's what prompted Dina to contact Chris's parents too, because she was like, that's really strange. So then based off this, Dana reports Shannon as missing. Now tipped off by Shannon's phone pinging near this waste management center in Knoxville, her friends and family begin to scour, you know, that area. And her father comes across Shannon's car in a street known as Cherry Street, just adjacent to Chipman Street. And the car is suspiciously clean and it's eerily like wiped of any prints. But Shannon's things are missing from the car, including a teddy bear and a phone charger. And then sadly, on Monday, January 8th, 2007, Chris's body is discovered. And it was found by a railway worker around noon. A detective who actually knew Chris through his own son was one of the first at the scene. 
And he was the one who decided to break the news to Chris's parents. So he calls Chris's dad and he tells him, like, you know, we think we found Chris's body. And at first Chris's dad was like, well, how do you know? How do you know it's Chris? And the detective was like, oh, it's so sad. He was like, I can tell it's Chris through his eyes. And the medical examiner actually originally found semen inside Chris's body, but the fire, you know, destroyed most of that evidence. And then in Shannon's car, they found a pack of Newport cigarettes and neither Chris nor Shannon smoked. So they were like, okay, we know this doesn't belong to them. And stupidly, there was also an envelope left inside the car with the address of LaMarcus's Chipman Street house. And this was just two blocks away from where the car was found. So police go there. On January 9th, police go to the house. No one was there. And so they went inside and they found the body of 21-year-old Shannon wrapped in these plastic bags inside this bin. And LaMarcus's prints were found all over this. All over this. Semen was also found inside Shannon's body, which DNA um, was able to determine that it was actually LaMarcus's and Latalvis's. So these two brothers both ripped her. Like, if you actually think about, like, what I'm saying, it is disgusting. So items that belonged to Chris and Shannon were also found all over the house. And the shell casings that were found inside the house also matched the gun that Chris was shot with. So it seemed like either they had no time or they just did not want to hide any of the evidence. They were just like, well, it is what it is. There was literally evidence everywhere. Now, because no one was in the house, a massive manhunt began to look for LaMarcus because at the time, all they had was, this is LaMarcus's house. A search of the crime scene turns up this video, this porn video, rented by one of the people in the house, which was George Thomas. So now the investigation crosses state lines because George is back in Kentucky now. They find LaMarcus's girlfriend, Daphne, who had lived in the house right up until the murder, but then mysteriously wasn't living at the house anymore. And they questioned her and she tells police that LaMarcus, Latalvis, George and Eric and Vanessa were all at the house on January 7th. Daphne says she had last seen LaMarcus when she dropped him off to a man named Eric Boyd's house. I'm guessing Daphne was probably so relieved to just be rid of LaMarcus and hopefully he was, I mean, she must've been terrified, but at the same time, like let's rat him out so he can just go away. So the police then track down Eric Boyd at his house and he immediately snitches and gives up the location of LaMarcus where he had been hiding. And LaMarcus was found by the SWAT team on January 11th, 2007. And he was hiding out in like this empty house and he was then arrested. LaMarcus told the cops like a bunch of different stories and initially denied having anything to do with the rapes and said all he was there for was to jack the car and that he used Shannon's car for drug deals. Like that's what he was doing it for. Meanwhile, in Kentucky, Latalvis, Vanessa and George are all arrested. So I guess Latalvis went over there to hide out. And now that they had all of them in custody, authorities counted on all these fools to just rat each other out. So George then reveals that it was LaMarcus who was the like mastermind behind these murders and Eric was his accomplice. So during the investigation, a journal entry was found inside a journal and it read as follows. I'll read it to you. It said, last night was one of a kind. We stayed with the crackhead and that is cool as hell. It snowed a little bit, but it's already melted. Let's talk about adventures. I had one hell of an adventure since I've been in the big TN. It's a crazy world these days, but I love the fun adventures and lessons that I've learned. It's going to be a long, interesting year. Can anyone guess who wrote that? Forensic testing found that this journal belonged to Vanessa Coleman. So now Shannon had DNA all over her, all over her. And this was a good thing because on the other hand, the evidence that was on Chris was destroyed during the fire. Essentially, if they had also set fire to Shannon's body, there possibly wouldn't have been like direct evidence linking this crime to any of the suspects. So now these five guys are aware that there is um, evidence linking each of them, right? So then they start just ratting out each other. 
So basically from all their different versions, the version that we've come to believe as to what happened on the night is as follows. So LaMarcus needed a vehicle, either for drug deals or not, and they happened to see Shannon and Chris with you know, this new car. So they were now the targets and then the five of them decided to ambush them at gunpoint. Another car approached, which was either driven by Latalvis or Eric, which spooked them, which like scared them. And when that happened, the two of them were then pushed into Shannon's car and then LaMarcus gets behind the wheel. They are then taken to LaMarcus's house. A key element in this crime actually turned onto Tennessee's criminal responsibility law, which basically says if you are aware of a crime and you do nothing about it, then you are also held responsible for that crime, which is kind of kind of crazy. So except for Eric, all of these suspects implicated themselves based on this because they all admitted they were in the house. Except for Eric, who didn't admit this. So basically by even admitting that you're in the house at all, you are implicated in this crime. All of them were now a part of everything. Among the questions that emerged was whether Vanessa was a willing participant in all of this or whether she was held against her will. But then in her stupid journal, she described the events of January 7th as fun adventures. So that obviously cast doubts <laughs> on any claims of her being innocent. Eric actually told the police that the only intention that night was to carjack Shannon and Chris. And then he later um, detailed the events of that night as told to him by LaMarcus to the police because he claimed that he had no part in any of this. He later had to have his statements recounted as inadmissible because of hearsay, right? Because Eric is telling the police what LaMarcus told him. So prosecutors then considered LaMarcus as the ringleader in the crime and the main perpetrator in the crimes against Chris and Shannon. He was the one that reportedly orchestrated the car theft, the kidnapping, and the murders. And I wish that like the evidence on Chris wasn't destroyed because I feel like the person that raped Chris, because it was determined to be at least one person, one male, I feel like they should have gotten extra charges on them. So after finding the bodies, the evidence, and the perpetrators, a date for trial was now set. Eric was found guilty of being an accessory to carjacking. He was the only suspect that wasn't charged with murder, and he was sentenced to a maximum of 18 years in prison on April 16th, 2008. And I mean, I feel like he should have been charged with murder if he was just standing there watching everything take place. He should have been. Now, the first trials for LaMarcus, LaTalvis, George, and Vanessa started in 2009, and over eight months, each of them was tried separately on 46 charges, and they included the uh, kidnap, rape, and murder of Shannon and Chris. LaTalvis Cobbins was found guilty and faced possibly the death penalty, but he was later given life without parole on August 25th, 2009. LaMarcus Davidson was also found guilty and jurors originally wanted to give him the death penalty. So LaMarcus Davidson was also found guilty and jurors originally wanted to give him the death penalty together with 80 years on top of other charges relating to the murders on October 29th, 2009. George Thomas was found guilty on multiple accounts and sentenced to life without parole on December 8th, 2009. Vanessa Coleman was the last to be tried and she was actually granted immunity on the carjacking charge, but not for the rapes and the murders. She was sentenced to 53 years in prison on May 13th, 2010. Now, this case began to stir like a lot of controversy because now this case began to stir a lot of controversy because it did not receive much media coverage. And this was critiqued because of how brutal the um, crime was and because the victims were white and the suspects were black. Also, a lot of information was like wrongly um, reported by the media stating that the victims had been like mutilated and like decapitated and dismembered and stuff like that. However, the police chief stated that there was no evidence that this crime was racially motivated and that the murders just seemed to just be a random attack by the suspects. They also stated that there was absolutely zero evidence that this was a hate crime. The statement made was, we know from our investigation that the people charged in this case were friends with white people, socialized with white people, and dated white people. So not only is there no evidence of any racial animus, there's evidence to the contrary. So some people disputed that saying, what does that mean? You know, like just because you date a white person, does that make you 
not racially motivated to target a white person or a black person or a Hispanic person. It's That's what people's arguments were. The case also attracted attention from white supremacists. On May 27th, 2007, around 30 white supremacists, they rallied in downtown um, Knoxville in the protests of the murders, and they were actually met with counter-protesters, many dressed as clowns, which is basically mocking the Ku Klux Klan. Ku Klux Klan, I can never say that. Now the judge, right? In 2007, Tennessee officials removed Richard Baumgartner, the judge who oversaw the trial, like the original trials in the case, from the bench due to his uh, dependency on prescription drugs. Throughout the trials, he was reportedly like incoherent. He was reportedly having sex and buying drugs during like all the trial breaks. And at times he was actually purchasing these drugs from convicts that he had sent to prison. His behavior called into question many of the cases he presided on, especially this one, because this one judge, the new judge in the trial, John Blackwood, tried to overturn all his convictions of these five um, perpetrators, I mean, in the Shannon and Chris case. And the prosecutors were like, what the hell? Like, they did it. Like, why are you going to try to overturn their convictions? So the prosecutors in this case ended up filing an appeal on behalf of Shannon and Chris's families because these poor families now have to sit through more trials. Like, it's a joke. Luckily, only George and Vanessa received retrials because all the other convictions stood. The courts again found both of them guilty, but Vanessa received lesser charges. I think hers was um, downgraded from 53 to 35 years, but they increased George's sentences. Um, he ended up getting two life sentences. I mean, I can't even believe this stuff happens in real life. And I probably just sound like a broken record saying that, but like when you're researching all these cases and you're talking about them and you're learning about them, it's kind of like, man, this shit happens. And I know that sounds stupid to say, but it's just like those five people were pure evil. Like, I truly believe evil exists in this world. Like, I have seen evil people. I have been around people who I'm just like, why are you such a bitch? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't, obviously, like, not to the extent of murder, but it's like, dang, some people just choose to be bad. Whatever level of extent, I mean, whatever extent of level, no, whatever level of bad that they are, (laughs) bad is bad, right? Like, some people, like, have you ever ever come across some people who are just like always mean, always assholes, always doing things. And whether it's you or whoever, the fact that they're even like that, you're like, dang, like there's levels to it, you know? And then there are people like this who can just kill with nothing, with no nothing. And how do we know what they started? Like maybe they started off doing those little bad things and then, you know, you get away with things and get away with things and then you turn into a murderer. Chris and Shannon, deserve so much better than what happened to them. It doesn't matter what race someone is because we are all humans. No one should have to endure anything like that except for the people who commit this kind of crap. Do it to yourself. In the aftermath, foundations were started on behalf of Chris and Shannon, the Shannon Gale Christian Foundation, as well as an annual baseball scholarship that was given to students at the high school that Chris went to. The house on Chipman Street that Shannon and Chris were tortured and you know killed in was destroyed and a memorial for Chris and Shannon was actually put in in that in that place. In 2014, two new laws were uh, passed, the Chris Newsom Act and the Shannon Christian Act. And the Chris Newsom Act was basically to prevent retrials in cases like Chris and Shannon's. And the Shannon Christian Act was passed to prevent the accused from painting victims in a negative light because the five of them or whoever it was, was trying to say that, you know, Chris and Shannon came to them to buy drugs. And that's how the whole thing took place when that was never proven to be true. The torture and pain that Chris and Shannon went through is so horrifying, horrifying. I cannot understand why people, human beings commit crimes against each other like that. Like that is why this world will not last because of us humans. Even though most of them received life sentences, I hope none of them get out on parole. Because, I mean, if you can do this to two strangers, what are you going to do to people that cross you, really cross you? They should never be able to taste freedom for the rest of their lives. Shannon and Chris didn't deserve this, and I hope that they are together somewhere living a happy and peaceful eternity in heaven or wherever you want to believe. Let me know your thoughts on this horrible case, guys. If you've watched this far, I hope you do subscribe. I hope you hit that like button, share it with your friends, and I hope you come back for more. So thanks so much, guys, for watching, 
I really appreciate all of you and I will see you in the next one. Besitos. Bye.